Hello, my name is Frank Gaffney. I'm the executive chairman of the Center for Security Policy and very pleased to be the moderator of an important and I think very timely conversation with several of our, well, hemispheres, um, most respected figures on matters involving the security of the hemisphere and particularly the security of freedom loving peoples and nations in it. Uh, we're going to be speaking to each of them in turn. I simply wanted to say um, a very special welcome to not only them, but to all of our audience today for this webinar sponsored by the Center for Security Policies Hemispheric Security Project. We are going to start with a, a very distinguished statesman from the nation of Peru. His name is Francisco Tudela. He formerly served as the first vice president of Peru, also as its foreign minister and as its UN ambassador. He has been a member of its legislature and active in its public policy life for decades. Um, he is a recognized scholar as well as a statesman and has contributed very much to a number of our webinars and programs and uh, interviews on our Secure Freedom Radio and uh, Securing America television program. And we're very grateful to him for his participation. Uh, I think what I will do, if I may, uh, is hold off on the introductions of our other two panelists until their time is at hand. And we'll begin with you, um, Mr. Vice President. Um, you have not only uh, provided us with a very important paper published by the Center for Security Policy entitled Peru's New Government's Threat to the Western Hemisphere. You've actually earlier this week also undertaken an enormously well, momentous and, and courageous step in initiating a process for the impeachment of that president, Pedro Castillo. I hope you'll talk about all of these topics and more in the remarks that you now are invited to make. Welcome, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Frank. I'm honored to be in, in this program of the Center for Security Policy. Uh, we've talked about this subject in the past, since June, Peru has a Marxist uh, a president. He belongs to a Marxist, Leninist, Maoist party called Peru Libre. And uh, he has, uh, he began his government by uh, proposing measures to control radio waves, to try to impose a referendum for a new constitution, etc. But with the, the, the pass of time, uh, he is becoming weaker and weaker because there is a very strong rejection from the population against him. Depending on the opinion polls, between 66.9 and 70% of Peruvians reject his policies, think he's incompetent, and believe he's corrupt. And he has only around 20% of support. That's the hard core of the left, nothing else. He came to power in a very difficult moment for Peru because we were in the middle of a constitutional crisis that he has tried to deepen with his proposal of a new constitution that has been blocked today by the constitutional court that has said that the presidential proposal is illegal and that Congress is right in the interpretative law that they have given to block that referendum by saying that any referendum has to be approved by Congress. So that's a huge victory today. And uh, Peru in the middle of this constitutional crisis exposed to a Marxist government uh, becomes uh, a country in the heart of Latin America with five boundaries with great geopolitical importance in which you have as main commercial partner, China, with 170 Chinese corporations in Peru, they are building 
the first port that China built in South America, 80 kilometers north of Shanghai, a huge port of more than 40 hectares of surface with a mole in form of N of 400 uh, meters long and uh, 29 meters wide, 17 meters of draft for the Super E3 Panamax ships, the biggest ones, container ships. But at the same time, it is very possible that if tensions in the North Pacific between the United States and China increase and you have a contention, then uh, uh, People's Liberation Army, Navy, uh, task force, carrier task, task force can use these ports that has even a a tunnel a mile long of reinforced concrete for the, for the route of the containers to the Pan American Highway, but at the same time it has internal deposits. I'm not saying that special weapons are going to be hid in those deposits, but what I, I, I see is that that port will have the full logistical capacity to support a People's Liberation Army task force, and that poses a challenge to not only the private of Asia, US policy of containment of China in the North Pacific, but also a, a, a peril in the Western South Pacific, uh, because if you go in a central line, let's say from, from Shanghai, to, to, to the west, you will reach Indonesia. And if you go in a central line from the southern port of Elon, Peru, you will reach Darwin in Australia. And so Peru is in the middle of a very sensible, of a very sensitive geopolitical area. Now this government, thank God, is in crisis. People reject it. The government cabinet has fallen yesterday. A new cabinet has been uh, named or put in, put in office. But the, most of the ministers are questioned, as happened with the other cabinets, because they have uh, uh, investigations by the police because of links to Movadev that this is a facade organization of the Shining Path. And was, one must not forget that the National Procurator began an investigation to Peru Libre, the party in government, because of its links to a criminal organization called the Dinamicos del Centro, the dynamics of the center who contributed to the campaign substantially, but at the same time, they are linked to the drug traffickers of the rhyme zone in the, in the south of Peru. There is ir Iranian influence uh, by a group called Inkari uh, Islam. Inkari means the resurrection of the Inca. It's a Shia group. Inkari uh, substitutes the Ali, the Imam of the Shia myth, and uh, and it and at the same time, the the websites and the TV stations uh, of Russia today in Spanish support strongly this government, and uh, as happens also with the Chinese and Al Jazeera, and all that network of opinion in the world as. The, the, far, the North American far left, we must not put that aside, but that's a fact. There is, and with this, I, I, I'll try to finish this, this, uh, this uh, sketch. There is now a battle between the Western linked liberals, the Western linked far left, that is linked to American universities, to European universities, to foundations in the US, in Germany, in England, against the government of Pedro Castillo, that is a government linked to Cuba, to Venezuela, uh, to Russia, to China, to Iran. 
So in this, this battle is raging because of the, 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 the Western, to put it in some way, because in fact, ideologically, they are not Western, but the Western funded far left feels excluded by the Castillo government from the cabinet posts and the consulting posts in the different ministries. And so there is a battle raging on now. To put an end to this, uh, uh, Castillo gave an interview, President Castillo, to CNN, to Fernando Rico. And in that interview, he offered a, a sovereign access of Bolivia to the Pacific Ocean through Peru. The journalist, El Rincón, realizing the peril of that proposal, said, but that is something you said long ago. Do you insist in saying it now? And he said, yes, I believe in that. That's, that's a claim of Bolivia. We have to consult the people. The people will be consulted. And that means a referendum. That is absolutely illegal. That is high treason, according to our constitution, our, our, our criminal code, and the code of military justice. Because the, the territory of the state is inalienable. It cannot be fractioned and sold. And it's a crime. Article 325 uh, of, the, of, the, of the criminal code says that anyone who, who, who proposes to do that or does that uh, has no less, will be condemned to not less than 15 years of jail. At the same time, the president represents the nation, represents the state, is the head of state, and he is the director, according to the constitution, of the foreign policy. And he represents the state in Peru and outside Peru. Now, the International Court of Justice of The Hague has said that the declaration of high authorities are binding and create rights for those that are benefited by those declarations. The most emblematic case is the case of the Muroroa uh, nuclear experiments by France, in which a declaration from the president of France was found by the International Court of Justice to create right for Australia and New Zealand. So, in fact, this is absolutely objective, and here I finish. So, six lawyers, including myself, we have presented a, a, an impeachment against the president to Congress for high treason. It is very, it's, it is, it's, its structure is very solid. And as you know, in the US, as in Peru, and let me finish with this, ignorancia juris non excusant. That's a general principle of law by which if you don't know the law, that doesn't exonerate you for abiding by the law. Yes. And so the next day he said, well, I'm sorry, I, I really didn't want to say that, but another thing, too late, mm. too late. He is a head of state. He should know the law. The minister of justice is his legal advisor. He has known better. There is nothing personal against him. You cannot have an irresponsible president that has been applauded by the Bolivian Congress the day before yesterday at in charge of Peru. Mr. Vice President, thank you very much for this comprehensive treatment of what has befallen your country and what it implies or will eventually inflict, unfortunately, upon others in the hemisphere. We're going to talk more about that prospect um, with the author of a very important new paper that's appeared at the National Interest as well as the American Foreign Policy Council with the title, Breaking the Authoritarian Wave. And 
Latin America. His name is Joseph Humeyer. He is the executive director of a marvelous organization, um, Center for a Secure Free Society. He is a Marine Corps veteran with considerable experience, um, both as a Marine and subsequent to taking off the uniform in Latin America, and truly one of our country's duty experts, in particular on the subject of not only authoritarianism indigenous to the hemisphere, but also the growing influence, as the vice president has just indicated, of external actors here aiding and abetting the, uh, the wave of which he will be speaking to us now. Joseph Humeyer, welcome once again to these webinars. We're delighted to have you with us, sir. The floor is yours. Well, thank you, Frank. It's always a pleasure to be with the Center for Security Policy. Uh, it's great to see uh, the Honorable Francisco Tudela once again. Thank you for your remarks. It's, it's very, uh, it, actually a bit of optimism in, in the case of Peru now seeing that uh, the president, uh, the current president of Peru, Pedro Castillo, is having some difficulties because as expected, his, uh, it's much different to govern than it is to uh, have a populist rhetoric uh, that, that often gets sold during the campaigns. And it's always great to be with my good friend, Sergio de la Peña, who is a, a top security official on Latin America, top policy official in Latin America. Uh, I'll be a bit brief, but I, what I like to do is unpack the article that uh, Frank was mentioning at the opening. So it's an article that I initially wrote for the American, for a American Foreign Policy Council's defense dossier. And then it got picked up a shorter version at the national interest. And the point of the article was to give a, a little bit of what the what in Latin America they love to say the coyuntura, the the, the landscape, uh, the political, economic, uh, security landscape of Latin America, and so there's always ebbs and flows to things in, in life and in politics, and in Latin America is no different. So if you look at the 21st century, there was these uh, kind of a pendular swing that would go left and then went right, uh, but there was characteristical differences between that shift. Uh, the first decade characterized by what they called the pink tide was this shift to the left. Uh, and there was more, uh, some governments that were left of center that, you know, were uh, more had leftist ideals and obviously policies, but had some semblance to maintain democratic institutions in their country. Uh, and then there was other leftists that had much more radical ideas of how they wanted to transform the institutions of their country, or in some cases even dismantle them and then uh, bring on a wave of authoritarian control. That's most notable in, in, in countries that were the core of that pink tide, which were called the Bolivarian Alliance. We're talking about uh, Venezuela, uh, that was at the beginning of Hugo Chavez, uh, Bolivia under Evo Morales, uh, Nicaragua under Daniel Ortega, and you could even lump in the Kirshners under Argenti uh, in Argentina, both Nestor and then Cristina Kirshner, even the PT, the Workers' Party in Brazil under Lula da Silva and then Dilma Rousseff. But at the, uh, as we headed into the second decade, the, the pendulum swung, the pendulum swung to the right, and there was what they some call a conservative wave uh, into Latin America uh, with more right of center presidents, more market friendly presidents, more business friendly presidents uh, that began to create policies that were A, uh, more oriented towards free enterprise, and B, uh, much more aligned with the United States in terms of having foreign relations and trade. Uh, but there was two big differences between when the conservative wave hit Latin America as opposed to when the pink tide hit, which is the pink tide one had a profound understanding of how to use non-state networks. They didn't just depend on the institutions of state power to have control and to project power, but actually built civil society networks, NGOs, and a range of different uh, uh, actors outside of the government that helped them persist into power even when they left government. That's why we saw Christina Kirshner come back in Argentina. That's why we've seen even Pedro Castillo was kind of brought up by these NGOs and, and, and uh, Francisco Tutela mentioned some of these networks that, that propelled them into power. And uh, to that, that was the one big difference. The, the, the more conservative way they governed in a more uh, traditional sense, if you will, without uh, just maintaining uh, government policies from government agencies, but didn't really consult much with civil society. But the other big difference, and I think this is the main one, especially for, for the audience of the Center for Security Policy, the bi other big difference was the uh, pink tide or the left, the, 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 the ALBA countries had a geopolitical vision. They knew what side of the world that they wanted to align with. They, had, they made, no, uh, um, they, they, they made no, no shyness of being able to align with countries that have a history of authoritarianism and even totalitarianism and their regions. I'm talking specifically about Russia, Iran, China, uh, and others. 
and they reoriented their foreign policy, and in some cases, even their trade policy to these countries. That's how China became a major trade partner of a lot of these countries in Latin America. As opposed to that, the conservative wave try to play nice with everyone. They try to have continue to have trade with China, continue to have top trade with the United States, continue to buy arms from Russia, to run a, continue to have military cooperation with the United States. And really that kind of flew in the face of what the era, of what the context was in terms of great power competition, which is the global landscape today. And so that just kind of takes us into where we're at today. And we're in the third decade as we you know, cross into the 2020, 2021, and now we're in 2022. And we're seeing a resurgence of the pendulum naturally swinging back to the left, but it's not uh, moderate democratic institutions or moderate democratic politicians, uh, leftist politicians are coming uh, into power. It's a new wave of individuals that have A, not a lot of experience in government, and B, have ideas that are much more aggressive in terms of uh, pushing forth a, a transformation of their countries uh, that could do a lot of damage in, in ways that we've seen in Nicaragua, Venezuela, and others. Uh, Francisco Tudela mentioned the case of Peru, and this was clearly demonstrated in the interview that he did with the CNN journalist Fernando Rincón, where he blatantly said, he said, I, don't, I was never trained on how to be a president. I was never schooled on how to be a president. And then the journalist asked him, well, is Peru your school? Is this the presidency your training? And he said, uh, the presidency will always be my school. And it's, like, you know, it's a little bit dangerous to start to learn on the job when you're, I mean, there's many jobs you learn on the job, but what presidency is probably not one of those that you want to try. Uh, but we're going to see this repeated time and time again. And my, big, my biggest uh, gripe, I guess, in this is the United States is kind of left out of these conversations because we're not really in the game when it comes to Latin America. We're, we, we're, you know, we're focused on a lot of things in the world. And I think under this administration, we're handling things a lot worse in the world. But nonetheless, in Latin America, I mean, there's countries where we still haven't appointed an ambassador, we haven't confirmed an ambassador. Uh, there's countries where we're still not engaged in high level talks on important geopolitical issues. Uh, there's other countries where we're uh, bickering over differences on important topics such as corruption and climate change. But nonetheless, we're letting those topics supersede our national interests in terms of uh, trade or national security. I'll give you a great example. You know, we, whatever you're thinking you have on, let's say, the president of Brazil, President Bolsonaro, uh, you may not agree with his, uh, his, his environmental policy, you may not agree with his policy on forestation or deforestation. Uh, and, and, and those could be legitimate conversations that could be had in a bilateral even more, or even multilateral fashion. But that doesn't mean that Brazil is not a strategic partner of the United States. As a matter of fact, one of the best partners of the United States when it comes to defense cooperation. So we can't impede our relationship with President Bolsonaro because we have differences on some issues and to basically have uh, in, in a difference on all issues. And, and so I guess with that, I just kind of sum up with my recommendation in the article, because the national interest titled it as breaking this authoritarian wave, is I think the United States has to come back to Latin America with a message. It's not enough to come to Latin America and say, don't trade with China, don't buy arms from Russia, don't focus, don't, like, kick out the Iranians and the Cubans. That, that's obviously uh, fine. And I think it's, you know, you can, you can say that, but we have to promote something ourselves. We have to sell something ourselves. The Latin Americans are looking for an ally that has a message, that has a broader vision of what the hemisphere should look like. And we can't be shy about that. And I think the, the, the aspect of, you know, and late last year in, the, in December, they had this, uh, President Biden had the summit for democracy. And I thought that was a missed opportunity because the narrative ended up becoming who you invited and who you didn't invite, rather than actually helping define what is democracy. Because, you know, we, we call it an authoritarian way, but none of these guys call themselves authoritarians. There's like President Castillo doesn't say I'm an authoritarian or Xi Jinping even or, or Vladimir Putin doesn't say I'm an authoritarian. So they're not defending authoritarianism. What they're doing is they're uh, using the term democracy and bastardizing the term, but they're actually authoritarians. And so we have to define the difference. What is our interpretation of democracy that's starkly different than what China, Russia, Iran, Peru, Venezuela, Nicaragua or whoever defines on, on, on democracy. And I think Latin America, we have to remember, it's only had about two year, 200 years of period. There, there's most of the countries celebrating their bicentennial of, of democracy. They, they gained their independence about 200 years ago. And many of them had dictatorships that lasted into the 20th century. So they're kind of new into this experience, experience of democracy. So the point of the article, and I'll conclude with this, was that we have to go beyond just talking about the term democracy, which has become bastardized in many respects. And we have to talk about the pillars that obtain a healthy democracy, such as individual liberty, such as the rule of law, such as national sovereignty. That's a concept that oftentimes gets lost, especially on uh, some, some of my fellow libertarians. 
And, and we have to be able to remind people that there's pillars that make a democracy function, especially in a representative democracy, that's a vast different vision than what China might call a democracy or even Iran calls a democracy because they just define it by election night, 50 plus one, a simple majority, which is basically a, a, a tyranny of the majority. And, and so that was the point of the article. That's the point of the message. And I think it's time for America to really project this into the hemisphere. Uh, we can't be shy about it. Of course, there was some stuff that happened in the past that you know the, the United States probably mishandled in the region, but that shouldn't make us shy about actually confronting what is tyrannical governments in the world that are in Latin America and that are propping up tyrannical governments in the region. Because I tell you, at the end of the day, what's the end game? What's Russia, what's China, what's Iran's end game in Latin America? It's very simple. They're trying to turn Latin Americans against the United States so that Latin America becomes inhospitable for, the, for Americans to travel, to trade, to, to feel safe in a region where uh, we live. It's our neighborhood. And so we have to be very conscious of that. So thank you, Frank. Thank you, everybody, once again. And I hope we have a little bit more back and forth with the Q&A. Uh, thank you. An excellent presentation. Um, and we will have, um, I hope, some uh, questions from our audience. Uh, there will be an opportunity for you to place those questions in the Q&A um, facility of the Zoom call, and I hope you will do so, and we'll try to get to as many of those questions as we can momentarily. But Joseph, you've, you've really set the stage uh, brilliantly, I think, together with um, Vice President Tudela uh, for our cleanup batter. Um, his name is Sergio de la Pena. He formerly served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Western Hemisphere Affairs during the Trump administration. He brought to that uh, important and I think uh, influential post a wealth of experience, uh, both uh, in the defense industry as a contractor, but also uh, as a 30 year veteran of the United States Army, including postings in two of the countries now very much caught up in the authoritarian wave, uh, Venezuela, of course, uh, uh, a very important um, energizer of that wave, one might say, uh, going back to Hugo Chavez's time, and more recently, um, the nation of Chile. Uh, he is deeply knowledgeable about this region, and I know he's given a great deal of thought, uh, not just in the abstract, but as a practitioner about what American policy should be. And uh, again, Joseph, you've teed up very nicely some of the possible options here. And uh, Sergio, I welcome you and uh, appreciate very much your participation in this program and invite you to uh, make your comments about uh, what's been said by the other panelists or uh, specifically and hopefully especially about uh, what we should be doing now as a nation to Fantastic. break the authoritarian wave. Thank you, Frank, uh, Vice President Tudela. Joseph, it's a real pleasure to be with you. Uh, we are actually in a very positive place in this hemisphere, if you look at it, uh, comparatively speaking with the other hemisphere. We are 33% of the global GDP. That's, that's what we represent in this hemisphere with only 18% of the global population and 35% of the landmass. So we are a collaborative, prosperous, and secure hemisphere with problems. Uh, we are a young hemisphere. If you look at the demographics, it's European, it's Native American, and it's Black, for the most part. And the number of languages are significantly fewer than you have on the other side of the globe. And so you have to start from that premise. However, there are influences in this hemisphere that are troublesome. Uh, when I was in the Pentagon, I would look at myself as uh, there's one uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for this whole hemisphere, and there were eight on the other side, just to put it into perspective. Now, what that means is that we have to be cognizant of these influences that, that Joseph and, and uh, the vice president were talking about. For example, if, when I was a young captain in the, in the late 80s, we were training our partners on how to combat uh, guerrilla insurgencies throughout the hemisphere. And what we found is that we were very effective. And so the guerrillas also found that to be the case. And most of that influence was coming out of Cuba fed by Russia. And the, the communist influence in this hemisphere, the socialist influence has been there since the very beginning of the Soviet Union. And so 
what we found is that the communists were not very effective at fighting, but they're very, very good at the ballot box. So if you look at, if you just start from what happened in Venezuela initially back in the late 60s, early 70s, when there was a guerrilla insurgency, the Venezuelans are very effective at, at combating it and they won. So Fidel Castro packed his bags and he moved to Chile and, and stayed in Chile for about a month in the, in the early 70s and helped Mr. Allende establish his government. Eventually the Pinochet regime uh, did not like the idea of having to con confront itself to a parallel army and they were defeated. So lesson learned, we don't do well with bullets. Let's go to the ballot box. Uh, Mr. Chavez was trained in the way of elections. He had been in a coup in 92. Uh, President Caldera, who, who succeeded Carlos Andres Perez, uh, was able to give him an exoneration that kept him, uh, with, without that exoneration, he would have been kept out of the political process. But with the exoneration, he was able to be a candidate for the presidency and he succeeded. The first thing that Mr. Chavez did upon election, and by the way, those were clean elections. I was an observer at both the primaries and the runoffs. And what happened was he immediately he said, we're gonna have election upon election upon election. So if people stop looking over his shoulder to see how those elections are being conducted. And you started with a constituent assembly, created a fourth branch of government. That branch was called the moral branch. Really what it, what it was is a, a conglomeration of the auditing uh, agencies uh, for the rest of the government. So he consolidated the auditing capability within the executive, and then he was able to run roughshod over the, the Supreme Court, the Electoral Council, and then eventually he was left with having to deal with the Congress. And we can just, you know, without just fast forwarding, he was very successful at consolidating power. And in doing so, it was based on a communist model, based on, uh, on, a, on Castro's model. And then he was also assisted by Nicaragua. So we were able to figure that out and eventually we were able to contain it. Uh, when I left office in um, October of 2020, we had the best alignment that we'd had in the hemisphere in years. The only countries that were out of alignment was, was Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela. Mexico and, and Argentina had um, some more neutral type governments under the Trump administration. We're now seeing that Mexico is moving more in the direction of uh, Im imposing a lot of socialist ideals in Mexico. And then we just found out that this week, Mr. Putin was visiting Argentina and the Russians are trying to set up some type of special relationship with Argentina. So you can see the influence happening there. And since then, what we've seen is Bolivia um, went to back to the MAS and the control of the socialist. Uh, you have Mr. Arce that's now the president. Yeah, you, in, um, in Chile, you see, you see what happened with Mr. Boric in, uh, in Peru. I think we've covered that one fairly thoroughly, much more detail than, than, than I have. Um, and then uh, in Honduras, you have Yamara Castro that is also moving in, in the direction of, of the socialists. So what you're seeing is that pendulum swing that Joseph was talking about, and it, and it goes both ways. Uh, unfortunately, there's two more countries that have elections this year that we have to keep a close eye on, and they're going to be significant by the result of their elections, and that's Colombia and that's Brazil. Those are major significant countries. If those go socialist, it's going to be more difficult to turn them back. Now, what we found is that when they go in that direction, the, the needs of the people are not met, and Peru is a perfect example. And I would argue that Chile is gonna go in the same direction. The promises that Gabriel Boric is making to his people are not gonna be those that he's gonna be able to achieve. It's, it's all about the dreams that all socialists have, for, you know, free healthcare, uh, free education, uh, better salaries, uh, shortened work week, uh, things such as uh, protecting the environment to the extreme, getting into all these issues with global warming. So you can see all of these leftist agendas that are being put in place. I would argue that the process that Chile used is not unlike what happened in the United States. 
because if you see what happened, you had a you had a, a, a rise in the subway fares that was insignificant, but they had organized their masses of people out onto the streets, not unlike Black Lives Matter, where you put many people on the street, and then you bring Antifa types that went and trashed uh, about 25 different grocery stores, large grocery stores, like, um, you know, like a giant Safeway here and there. And then they also destroyed something to the tune of about 40 out of 70 of the Metro stops, all coordinated attacks. And they burn short, they, they burn churches. And if you listen to the socialist media, they talk about mostly peaceful protests. The graffiti that's been put up is not unlike what we've seen in the United States. So there is a coordinated effort amongst all of these groups. And I would argue that those are being at least uh, given a, a, a pattern to follow from what came of the old communist international, which is the Foro de Sao Paulo that was created to replace the communist international. Uh, and that was a group that Mr. Fidel Castro and Mr. Luis Ignacio Lula formed to be able to provide sort of an umbrella of doctrinal um, principles that these groups can follow. And as, as, as Joseph has pointed out, what you're seeing in some of these young socialist governments is they are full of good ideas or they, they speak the language of democracy in the case of, of uh, I was listening to in, in, in the case of Chile, there, there's, it's, he's gonna, Mr. Bortz is gonna govern for all the people. He's going to defend democracy. He's going to provide uh, social benefits for all Chileans. So this is the way that they start. And one of the things that they like to attack is things such as the governments that existed before. In the case of, of, uh, of Chile, they talk about the fascist uh, right-wing uh, opponents that they had following the, the, the model of Pinochet. If you look at Chile, Chile did a lot of wrong things in the way that they overthrew the government, but that created a model that no one else in the hemisphere, besides the United States and Canada perhaps, have been able to match. And so Chile, because it was so wealthy, there's always the argument that there is uh, inequality at the, lower, at the lower levels. If you look at the way that they're dividing the the different groups in society, it's not unlike what's happening in the United States. So if you go back to the model that, that Chavez created, where he divided the people and the way that they were able to get people out into the streets uh, and, and the way that they're able to make all of these promises using the language of uh, democracy, I think we have some challenges ahead. Now, how do we fight those challenges? Well, let's start by looking at this administration. If you see how many high level visits we've had into the hemisphere, uh, I can only think of about four, two by Vice President um, uh, Kamala Harris, uh, one by, by the National Security Advisor and another one by Mr. Blinken. And I think that's about as many as I can count at that level. There has been very little engagement at the highest levels with the rest of the hemisphere. It's very difficult to convince people that we are the model to follow when we don't get into the region. Our elections that used to be the gold standard for the rest of the world became a laughing stock when we took over a month to make the final determination of who was the president. If you look at the elections, even in Peru, uh, the, the, the results were known within hours. And I would argue it's probably like two or three hours. In Chile, it was the same thing. In Honduras, it was the same thing. All paper ballots, and I've been an observer in Mexican elections, same thing. By 10 o'clock, when the polls close at six, they know the results. That is a model that was presented by the United States. It was the model that people followed. And now we've not, we're not in a position to be able to set that model. And there's a significant lack of engagement that has to come back. We have to talk about what we represent. And as, 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 uh, as Joseph said, it's not democracy, you know, 50 plus one vote. It's how do you protect the minorities? How are, do you ensure that everybody has a voice? Um, so I, I want to stop there because I'd like to hear from, from uh, the audience if they have some questions. So thank you. 
I think we do have a couple of questions and, and I've got a couple of my own and we may start with mine. Yes. Um, uh, Rank has its privileges, as they say. Um, but I want to thank you, Sergio. That was uh, very illuminating uh, with respect to, you know, American policy. And uh, I think you're, you know, shedding light on a critical failing of successive presidents, not just this one, that yes. uh, what some people call our backyard, um, I think of it as more our front yard, um, has been woefully neglected, uh, malign neglect oftentimes by um, successive administrations of both parties. Um, which brings me in a way to um, the question that I put to you a bit, and that is, um, what do we do about uh, the problem, uh, the authoritarian wave, as it's been described by Joseph, uh, specifically with regard, if I could, to two nations uh, that are both um, neighbors of Peru, uh, both um, very much uh, vital parts of the free world at this moment, but also um, facing elections imminently and uh, quite possibly will be subject to some of these same impulses and forces. Uh, so if we could have maybe quickly from each of you, uh, starting with you, Mr. Vice President, um, some thoughts on Colombia and Brazil and what those of us who love freedom in this country, but in the region as well, uh, can and must do about it. Uh, thank you, Frank. I, I, I couldn't agree more with, with Joseph and Sergio in their analysis. Uh, what the U.S. can do is support representative democracy forces, representative democracies uh, parties. Uh, why? Because the Foro de Sao Paulo and the Grupo de Puebla, that is the prestige organization of great socialist leaders in Latin America, have in their agenda democracy. But it's a different democracy from the democracies we have. It's direct democracy. And that is why Evo Morales has invented in Bolivia plurinationality. And that concept has been included in the Constitution, Republica Plurinacional de Bolivia. And they are trying to apply that to Peru to fracture these countries on ethnic lines. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a democracy of direct consultations. When you ask someone of the Chinese Communist Party if they have democracy in China, they will say, oh, yes, we have it at local level. They consult in that small village or about, I don't know, agricultural problems or whatever. But the big decisions are taken by the party. Let's not forget also that Hitler was elected. Yes. And he, he became chancellor of the Reich and was given full powers legally by the German Reichstag, the parliament. And he never passed a law again through Congress. He used direct democracy. He used referendums and plebiscites for his laws, racial laws, whatever. The same thing happens with the Grupo de Puebla and the, the Foro Sao Paulo. And, and they, the, the pro democracy proposal is a plebiscitary democracy. It's a referendum oriented democracy. And the US has to fight this battle at a cultural level, defending the philosophy, the history and the culture of representative democracy and its great philosophers and politicians. It's true that the US forgot about Latin America after the fall of the Soviet Union, because the US thought that Latin America would follow the US uh, uh, in a normal way, but it, ha it didn't happen that way. The fall of the Sao Paulo was organized by three persons, by Fidel Castro directly, by Ignacio Lula da Silva, and by Javier Diaz Canseco, the Peruvian head of the Mariateista Communist Party. And they must have in 1990, because the Soviet Union hadn't fallen yet, 
they must have had Soviet uh, support for that. And yeah. so the Foreign of Sao Paulo is a great vehicle for Russia and from China to get mm -hmm. into this continent. And so it's yeah. very important for the US to have alternative uh, regional organizations. This is really a perfect send up for you, Joseph. Of course, you've been writing extensively on what these foreign external powers are doing in our hemisphere. Um, do you agree with the assessment that we've just heard from Vice President Tudela? And if so, how can we instill that alternative model that he's talking about um, in the stead of the forum and its uh, uh, direct democracy? No, I absolutely do agree with what Francisco Tudela just said. Um, and and it's, a little bit, it's a little bit of an extension of the point that I was making in the sense that there's this different interpretation of democracies, right? And we have to be very clear on what we're defining when we say democracy, because then not it gets clouded in the general public's mind that you're just talking about elections, democracy, we're all on the same page. And then what happens is the, the disinformation campaigns and all the manipulations of people's perceptions starts to take place. Uh, I'll, I'll make one point. Uh, I'll make a couple points, but I'll make one point in particular where I think this is what I've noticed in Latin America over the last uh, recent decade. Uh, and one of the reasons I think that we're seeing this resurgence of these more populist, socialist, authoritarian types. Uh, we have a lot of internal divisions in Latin America that need to be healed. And we need to heal them quickly. Uh, there are differences among political parties. There's very historic political parties in many cases. Uh, but these divisions right now uh, are, are secondary to the challenges in that, and I would say even adversaries that we're facing. We may not agree on everything and say you're in the more libertarian camp or you're in the more conservative camp or you're the, in, in the more uh, Christian democratic camp. You may not agree on everything when it comes to the social values or economic policy, but you all agree that you don't want to see totalitarian governments in your country. You don't want to lose that primal individual liberty that you cherish and so hold dear. And so we have to get past those differences. And in many cases, the way we've lost elections, and I say we and the collective, those that are more conservative or right of center governments, have been because they've been internal fighting among these candidates or the, among these political parties that diminish the capabilities of those political leaders. And then someone like a Pedro Castillo would surface. The case of Peru was interesting because they came together at the last minute, which was very inspirational, even a legendary feud between the Fujimoristas and Mario Vargas Llosa, which have been fighting forever for more than a decade or more in Peru. They came together, but it was just too late. It was just a little bit too late. If they had done that before, earlier on, they may have been able to send a big message in Peru and potentially uh, would not have had, had the same result. I, I, I'm, that makes me a bit pessimistic with what I'm seeing in Colombia and Brazil. I'm seeing a lot of internal fighting, uh, both among the candidates that, or the, the political leaders that should be united. I'm seeing uh, Bolsonaro's uh, coalition has been fractured. Uh, they, they separated it. They pitted them against each other and not different too unlike what we've seen here in the United States on, on, on certain levels. Uh, actually, I'll give you a, a one country I am optimistic about, uh, and hopefully this maintains, which is Argentina. And I think Argentina, if the legislative victory that Argentina had last year, last uh, November, if I'm not mistaken, where the uh, ruling coalition, uh, mostly Peronist and Kirchneristas, uh, lost their control of the legislature was because these different uh, opposition or these different right of center uh, co parties, coalition parties and political leaders came together. They came together despite their differences. And they said, you know, enough is enough. We've had 12 years of Kirchnerismo. Now we, we're coming back to that same policy. We've had you know, who knows how long of Peronismo and they want to get past that. And, and they came together. So I'm a bit optimistic on Argentina and I'll stay optimistic on Colombia and, and, and Brazil. But I, I tell you, it's going to be a, a difficult road because they're uh, and, and some of this is amplified by disinformation. And we, that's the other element that I was going to make, the other point that I was going to make. And to your question, uh, Frank, how do we get past this? Democracies need to get really smart on the information battle space. I mean, this is warfare nowadays. And this is what people, I think, often lose sight of. We, we look at this as just an election, a process, a democratic process. We applaud whoever wins. For, the, for many, for some of these authoritarian or aspiring authoritarian leaders, this is war. They're not just looking, they're not looking for second place. They're going all in or nothing. And, and so uh, in that a space. They're willing to bend the rules. They're willing to reshape the rules. They're willing to uh, use different elements to, to manipulate the, the information 
uh, that comes out uh, uh, from their countries, all in an effort to, because they believe that they have been uh, wronged by history. And so they're trying to correct that wrong. So they feel justified in, in their effort. And I think we have to make uh, remind them and make it very important that the, we have the same level of conviction, the same level of determination, and the same level of political will. And I think it's happening. It's starting to bubble up. I, I see it here in the United States. I see it in many countries in Latin America. But hopefully it happens quicker and it happens faster. And we, we were able to unite because Russia, China, and Iran, it, beyond whatever political party you're from, they don't care, Republican, Democrat, uh, liberal, conservative in Latin America. They, they don't care. At the end of the day, they're looking to colonize these countries. They're looking to change the world order. They're looking to be able to impose their control uh, across the globe. And, and I think any Latin American country, that's not in your favor, whatever political stripe you come from, uh, especially if you hold the values of, uh, of freedom in your, in your heart. Amen. Uh, this is such a key point. Uh, it is a neo-colonial operation, I think, that's taking place, especially uh, notably as uh, the vice president was talking about with respect to the build out of infrastructure that can be used for power projection by uh, communist China. Sergio, um, your thoughts on both Brazil and Colombia and uh, the authoritarian wave, uh, uh, maybe tidal wave that uh, is uh, heading their direction. But also what you think of these recommendations as to what we can do and any further that you have in mind. I agree. I'm, very, I'm, I'm concerned about both Colombia and, and Brazil. In, in the case of Brazil, a, a poll just came out this week, with, which had uh, President Bolsonaro down to 30 and uh, Mr. Lula up to 41. Mm. So that's not, a, that's not a good indicator. And in the case of Colombia, uh, we don't want to see a repeat of what happened in Chile, where even though... Um, uh, the socialist candidate, uh, Mr. Petro, is uh, in, in the last elections was at 40. Uh, that was too concerning for everybody. And what, what's happening now is that the Colombian um, opposition, the, the center right uh, to the right, are many and they're very splintered. And this is exactly what the socialists want. That's what happened in Chile. You had, you had the, the socialists come in number two, and then uh, in the second wave, they were able to mobilize a, people, a bunch of people that didn't vote, and then they came back and they won. So that, I'm concerned about that particular dynamic. I also think we need to start looking at uh, platforms that are used in these countries that are also in existence here in the United States. And censorship has become a tool uh, that can be easily manipulated. So if we allow, or if these countries allow the censorship by using some of these international platforms, I think that's very concerning. So that's something that they need to look into. Now, how do you fix all of this? The, the key thing is that you, you do it in the battleground of ideas and you have to use the media as well as they do. You've got to be able to message a lot better than they do. You've got to be um, confronting their, creating a counterpoint for their ideas in, in confrontation. And, and the way that you do that is you, build the institutions or reinforce the institutions. You don't need to start over from scratch. We have institutions that are favorable to the United States. You've got the OAS and the, the consortium of organizations that go with it. Uh, you've got the Inter-American Defense Board that has been languishing because we haven't been giving it too many resources. Uh, and then there's these countries that are now moving in the direction of the left that want to get rid of that and, and start up the ALBA countries again uh, which is not a good place. I was in, in, in uh, Ecuador where the ALBA headquarters was and they had they'd basically shut it down. There was no funding for it. And so the, the governments that are coming into power now from the left are looking at re reconstructing all that because you've got to have those institutions to be able to execute on your wonderful ideas. And I can't overemphasize enough the importance of personal relationships at the highest levels. We had engagement upon engagement upon engagement with the, with the Trump administration. And we don't see that right now with the current administration. What I've seen in the past before that was whenever you didn't engage, you did not have the same type of results. The, the people like me count on the Secretary of Defense visiting the region. I traveled with Secretary Mattis. We went to Buenos Aires. We went to uh, Rio de Janeiro. We went to Brasilia. We went to Santiago. We went to Bogota. In, in the first year he was in office. We did the same thing with Mexico. And we, we, did that, we did several visits and that allowed me to be able to then have personal relationships with every minister of defense. That's the type of 
engagement that you must have. Now, getting back, into very, I just want to touch briefly on, on what we were talking about with the threats to the region. The Chinese want access to raw materials, they want markets, and they want ports. And so what we've seen in Peru is going to happen. I mean, they, they tried it in, in, in uh, Panama, both ends. Uh, they're trying it every place that they can. They're looking for Argentina. They're looking to Uruguay. They're looking to every country. And COVID presented the opportunity for them to come in and give you the fire extinguisher once they've started the fire. And so this is the situation we're confronting. You've got to be able to make sure that they understand that we also get a say in this. And you need to be able to talk to partners and articulate to them what it means to be part of a network that the Chinese run. If you wanna give up everything that you've got and you wanna give situational awareness about your own country to the Chinese, that's what happens with their technology. And we used to voice that at every, every place that we went to indicate the risks that go with that. And so I think it's a combination of different things, but to emphasize the importance of the, the key leader engagements, as well as, as strengthening the institutions. Thank you, Sergio. Uh, let me just fine tune this a little bit and, and maybe one quick last round with you all. Um, we've talked about the degree to which the left um, has established institutions, um, the form of San Paulo, the, the longest running, I guess, in this group of the Puebla uh, in Peru is emerging as well, I take it. Uh, maybe Alba will be back. Um, and certainly there are other more informal arrangements. How important is it to outcomes in Brazil and, and Colombia most immediately, and perhaps to supporting freedom-loving people like uh, Francisco Tudela and, uh, and others in his country, Peru and elsewhere throughout the region, that there be some more formal institutional partnership uh, between the United States and nations that, that still do um, support us. And I think, Joseph, you, you put your finger really on it. The three pieces of liberties, the rule of law, and to your point, Sergio, just now, sovereignty, uh, all of which are very much imperiled. Um, Sergio, maybe we can start with you. Certainly. I, I think that you, you, you have to make sure that you have a cogent message. You've got to make sure that you are looking at the institutions and, and the organizations that are working against you. They, they are very creative in the way that they do business. The Foro de Sao Paulo was a very, very capable organization that they set up, which is also affiliated with what's called the GUE, the United European Left. They're the same thing except in Europe. And so once they figured out that the photo was working and it was a continuation of the Communist International, then you create El Grupo de Puebla that was, that was started in Mexico with the assistance of, of Mr. AMLO. He's been a party to all of this. And what he did is he said, we need to have some, some luminaries of the socialist world. So they looked at heads of state with a leftist leaning, Lula's one of them, Mr. Samper from Colombia and others. Uh, so these people are giving greater strength to the institution. So when I talk about institution building, they're building institutions and we're not countering it because we don't want to call it for what it is. They're socialists and it's an international, it's an international net. The socialists are very good. What the communist international became is sub elements that are of like minds and they're continuing to provide that umbrella of ideas that other groups can take. And then they have sidebar meetings where the more radical elements within these organizations are able to then do their own planning. If you look at the original membership of the Foro de Sao Paulo, they used to be more blatant. They had the Sendero Luminoso, they had the MRTA, they had the Montoneros. They would blatantly put that on their website. If you go now, they kind of softened it a bit. They talk about the communist parties of each one of these countries. And so they're very good at that. We need to be able to do the same thing. And we also need to start making the cost of doing business with the Chinese more expensive. And a lot of that gets outside of the realm of military engagement, but gets into trade. It gets into tariffs. It gets into a united 
U.S. position on where we are with the hemisphere. And, and it requires work. It requires the National Security Council to do its job. It requires us to make sure that any policy decisions we have are interagency and they're, they, we work it through our partners. We get with the country teams in the embassies and then we put it in the embassy websites and talk about what we represent. We need to be waging the war of ideas, as I think you put Indeed. it. Uh, just a few more um, thoughts on the importance of an institutionalized effort along these lines. <clears throat> no, I think it's absolutely important. Uh, this, this is network-centric warfare. Uh, we have to build networks. And, and, and some of these networks are governmental, but oftentimes many of these networks are non-governmental. And this is where we've been behind the, the, the curve. Uh, the, the Foro Sao Paulo, these, all these other groups, they, they rely on non-state networks. Those non-state networks have tremendous amount of power because they're able to amplify information, messaging. They're able to get into the grassroots. They're able to interpret things to the way that these uh, more socialist political leaders want things to be interpreted. Uh, we have not done that. Uh, and oftentimes someone more a right of center or more conservative, more market friendly presidents uh, have come to power in Latin America. They've kind of abandoned civil society or really didn't focus on that. And they looked at trade policy. They looked at the instruments of statecraft and, and governmental policy as their main tool. Uh, and, and frankly, in today's information environment, the governments are really the, the worst at communicating in most mm -hmm. cases. It's actually the think tanks, the activists, the even the 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 well, other civil society actors that are much better at communicating. And, and, and I'm, not, I'm not necessarily promoting a sort of alliance between state and non-state. I don't think that necessarily needs to happen. But if you're promoting the same messaging, that kind of uh, unity happens on its own. Um, and, and in that, I would say we, we cannot be afraid of talking about ideology because I think there's been some uh, uh, shyness, I think, from Americans to, or from the United States government to talk about ideological differences that we may have with certain countries in the region or even their external state actors. Uh, and, and I don't think it's we have to do that because uh, it's frankly not ha happening on the other side. On the, on the other side, they're clearly promoting a specific ideology. And when you have a targeted marketing campaign that has an ideological bent, it works. It actually gets into the to the minds, into the psyche, into the psychology of the people that you're going to be governing. And, and if those people don't understand your ideology or they think it's wishy-washy or you're talking things in very vague, abstract terms, the, the messaging doesn't work. I mean, Coca-Cola, obviously, they don't promote an ideology, but they're very clear on what they're trying to do. They're trying to sell you something so that you can consume it. And we just aren't selling anything. We're, we're going to Latin America, as Sergio mentioned, and we're talking about things, but we're not selling anything in Latin America. The Chinese, they may be very subtle, uh, but they're selling communism in, in, in Latin America, and it's very clear. The Iranians, they're selling Islamism in Latin America, and it's very clear. The Russians sometimes are a little bit uh, funky because they're kleptocratic, but nonetheless, they still uh, believe in state monopoly, state control over the natural, re oh, I'm sorry, over the, uh, over, over the economy. Uh, even if it's a, a blended version of what it was during, during the Soviet Union. So th that would be my, my, my big recommendation. We need to build up civil society. And, and, and frankly, uh, civil society may be our last hope in, in Latin America, especially if Colombia and Brazil uh, go the wrong way. Well said, uh, Joseph. Um, Francisco Tudela, um, this is, of course, not an abstraction as far as you're concerned. This is very much um, the sine qua non of whether there is going to be hope for your country going forward, I believe. Um, does um, your government uh, have a clear path to considering to con continuing to consolidate power and, uh, and for that matter, project it beyond? Or yes. will they be effectively countered by civil society um, members like yourself, um, backed yeah. up by the kind of people and efforts and institutions, hopefully, that we've just discussed. We hope that they will be countered. But on the other hand, they are coping the state. Even if a cabinet falls and a new one comes in, they get into the structure of the Peruvian state at the middle and lower levels overall the Peruvian territory. And that will be very difficult to clean if a really democratic government comes afterwards. Then let's see what each of the international competitors in Latin America sells. The Chinese sell quick profits. They can pay you two times the price for a concession. They will not haggle for a price. They will pay you what they want and get in. 
they have no limits. So China is a source of profit for corrupt and even non-corrupt Latin American countries. And that is something that the US has to take into account. What do the Russians sell? The Russians sell an ideology. It's the ideology of self-determination without moral limits. That is, you can have a cannibalistic government, but the Russians will defend the principle of self-determination and the right of that country to be cannibalistic. So let's be frank, they are selling a very strong product. It's a product that is invoked by President Castillo. And the, 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 the way to counteract that is to understand that the US has to confront these products with real alternatives. When Joseph talks about what we would call the, 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 the moral values of representative democracy, it's not abstract things. If I read the Federalist, the Federalist is, proposes real policies, concrete things for government. It's not utopia. Utopia is what the socialists are selling under the name of democracy, under the name of indigenous, under the name of plurinationality. At the end of the day, you have a plutocratic clique that is in control of an impover impoverished population in a Latin American country like, like happens in Venezuela. Why has this happened? Because the Foro Sao Paulo began operations in 1990, that is 31 years ago, with the Russians in, with the Russians in, with the Europeans in. Let's not forget that Podemos is part of the Foro, even if it doesn't appear. <laughs> Let's not forget that Rodriguez Zapatero, the ex prime minister of Spain, is one of the luminaries, as Sergio says, of the Grupo de Puebla. And the US from the year 2001 onwards until 2016 withdrew from Latin America, didn't sell anything to Latin America until President Trump said that migration had to be fought in Latin America, fighting the corrupt governments in Latin America. That message was a good one, but it should be polished because the problem is not only corruption, but socialism that is intrinsically corrupt and that creates nomenclaturas, that creates uh, cliques that uh, access to all the riches of the country and exploit the people as slaves, as happens in Cuba, as happens in Nicaragua, as happens in Venezuela, where the apparatchiks of the government had big, have big yachts and huge mansions and live like kings. And the people have to look for food in the garbage cans. That's the reality. So the US has in the, in the initial message of President Trump about the migration problem that came from Latin America and the way to fight that migration problem, it has the seed to develop a whole vision for Latin America that should be developed and, and, and should be the main line of, of influence of the US in Latin America. And at the same time, to be able to, to reestablish business relations with the continent and create networks because American embassies in Latin America, in fact, are mainly linked to government officials in each country, but they don't overflow that relationship with government officials and some journalists and whatever, they should. There, there should be a wider social uh, area of influence that the US should search in Latin America. Mr. Vice President, thank you. A very pointed 
call for our involvement in the hemisphere, which I couldn't agree more with. Um, the only quibble I might have is your use of the term socialism in that context. It seems to me as though it's more and more full on communism. And um, that's, it's, I know, very much thing. present in your own society. Yeah. It's the same well, thing. one Most has a more benign uh, appearance, I think, to many on the outside rather than those who've been subjected to one or other of these forms of, uh, of well, authoritarianism at best and totalitarianism inevitably. We're going to wrap it up with this. I, I just want to say to each of our panelists, um, uh, former Vice President Francisco Tudela, Joseph Humeyer of the Center for a Free, uh, so Secure Free Society, and of course, Sergio de la Pena, a former Defense Department uh, senior official for Latin America. Uh, thank you for your service uh, to the cause of freedom in your various capacities and for the clarity that you bring to the stakes, not just for the countries most immediately involved, not just for the hemisphere outside of the United States, but for our country as well. And it is so vital that we understand as you gentlemen do, that um, the problems that we've been discussing will not be confined to Latin America um, or some distant reach of it. Uh, they will come here, they are coming here, and it is important for us to be engaged there to try to ensure that it doesn't get considerably worse, notably in Colombia and Brazil in the course of this very year. Uh, with that, I want to just say thank you to our audience um, for your attention, uh, both those of you listening at the moment and those of you who will participate um, in the course of uh, this uh, program being online, as it will be shortly. Uh, it is a privilege to be able to sponsor these programs at the Center for Security Policies Hemispheric Security Project. We look forward to doing more of them with these gentlemen and others in the days ahead. In the meantime, thank you again to you all. Uh, please stay tuned at securefreedom.org for more in this space and others. Thank you very much and have a good night.